church. We are glad you are here this morning. If you happen to be visiting with us this morning, we are especially thankful that you are here because you are our honored guests. Everyone watching online, we're always thankful that you tune in that way as well. I heard a story of a country preacher in a small town that was holding an evening revival baptism service down by the riverside when in the middle of the service, the very well-known town drunk happened to be walking by and he stumbled his way into the service and the preacher comes up out of the water, grabs a hold of him, and says, are you ready to find Jesus? And he says, yes. So the preacher drug him down to the water, put him underneath of the water, brought him back up, and said, have you found Jesus? And the drunk replied, no, I haven't found Jesus. Well, the preacher was a little taken back by that response, so he dunked him again. And this time he held him just a little bit longer under the water. And he brought him back out and said, now have you found Jesus? And the man said, no, I haven't found Jesus. The preacher didn't know what to do except to dunk him a third time. So he held him down this time for the better half of a minute, brings him back out of the water and says, surely by now you have found Jesus. And the man gasped for air, wiped his eyes and said, are you sure this is where he fell in, right? Well, <laughs> we have been... We have been in a series of messages that I have called Diving Deeper, Exploring the Depths of Baptism. And if you have your bulletin this morning, inside there's an outline. This has some blanks and some scriptures and some things to help you follow along. Now, each week I have been preparing a take-home sermon study sheet to help you go a little bit deeper in your study. The, the, the study take-home sheet comes directly from the sermon, basically the same points, many of the same scriptures, but just with some questions and some things to help you reflect as you are thinking about this wonderful journey we're on, discovering the significance of baptism in the life of the believer. It, it is in some ways where people can find and discover and experience Jesus because you are baptized into Jesus. And it's so much so much more than that. It is such a complex thing that, that I don't think four weeks is going to do it justice, but that's what we're going to give it for this go-round at least. I have also been writing some fairly extensive articles on my blog each week for any of you who like to read and or you just want to torture yourself you know, that week. You try to read some of those because I go a little bit deeper with each message with those as well. We, we kick this series off talking about the idea of, of, of the who, the what the why, the how of baptism, that, that it is something we believe is full immersion. We won't hold you under there for a minute and a half, but we do fully dunk. We believe it is how we are into Christ. We believe it's for the forgiveness of sins. We believe it's how you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We believe it's a cleansing and a washing and a renewal that takes place. But what I wanted to do this morning, just for a few minutes, is spend a little bit more time on this idea of the necessity of baptism. And if there happened to be anyone here and or listening online who are on the fence about the decision of being baptized, that I might maybe help push you in a direction of answering that question for yourself based off of what God says in his word as to, do I really need to be baptized? Now, in the Bible, the first four books of your New Testament, they're called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the reason they're called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is because they were written by these four guys who happened to be named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these four books, what we call gospel, the good news, these are accounts of the life of Jesus. And in all four of them, in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and in John, they all four end with the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, his time he spends for those 40 days before he ascends back to the Father, and he gives to his followers, he gives to his disciples, he gives to us as the church today, as we are still followers and disciples of Jesus, what we call the Great Commission. Now, it's in all four of them. 
In Matthew, it's found in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. In Luke, it's found in chapter 23, verses 44 through 49. And then Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 1, Luke sort of continues. He adds a tag on to that great commission. In John's gospel, it's found in John 20, verse 19 through 23. But then in Mark's gospel, one of the smallest of the gospels, a, a gospel that just gets right into the action of the who and what of Jesus. He, in verses 15 and 16, describes the great commission that Jesus gives them this way. It's the first scripture on your outline. It's here on the big screen. Jesus says to them, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Something interesting that the King James Version of the Bible, just curious, show of hands, any of you still, even if it's just occasionally, any of you still read the King James Version of the Bible? You ever get that out every now and again? One of the things that King James does in, in that translation is they use the the on the end of some of their verbs, you know. And if you read this text from the King James Bible, it will read, he that believeth and is baptized will be saved. But it's interesting that it doesn't say he that believeth and is baptizedeth will be saved. And it's good because anybody sitting in the front row of me and I'm preaching that, you're in trouble because that's, that's hard to get out, right? That's a tongue twister. But there's more to it than that. In the, most of the time, not always, but most of the time in the King James Bible, whenever you see a TH on the end of a verb, it is denoting the fact that that verb in the Greek language, which is what most of the New Testament was originally written in, is a verb that connotes, that means a ongoing action. And when you see verbs that do not end in the TH, not always, but most of the time, it means it's a once done type of a verb or action. It's, it's not a continuing action. So it's interesting that King James, I think, gets this right when he says that the, Jesus told them, tells us today, that the person who believes and continues to believe and is once and for all baptized, will be saved. See, baptism is a once-in-your-lifetime event, as in an action, but it is something that should impact, change, and transform for the rest of your life during this side of eternity as you are walking in Christ with God because of the power and what takes place through the baptism, not getting wet, but the power of God in washing away our sins. Now, when it comes to the discussion on baptism, I want you to look at the next slide. There's usually two camps. There, there tend to be two views when you talk to people about baptism, when you talk to preachers from different religious camps. Often they'll fall into one of these two categories. Now, the first category is that it has nothing to do with your salvation. Zero, zip, nada. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not by any works that you have done, but yet this is the gift of God. So therefore, to say that uh, grace plus anything is how you are saved, that is a work. That is adding to that. So they will say baptism, it's a good idea. You may or may not want to do it, but it's not an essential aspect. It doesn't really have anything to do with salvation. Now, I don't have time this morning because I'll keep you here way too long, but a couple weeks ago, we talked about the difference between baptism as a work of God versus a work of man. And I suggest you go back and listen to that message if you didn't, and or check out the blog and the study sheet. But the other side of the camp, because I know preachers who will say this. I, I know people who say, hey, but it's just nothing. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. But then over here, I have also heard preachers who will say, well, that's how you are saved. I mean, that, that's where it happens. If you don't get wet, you are not saved. 
that baptism is where? Why do you say that? Well, because Mark chapter 16, verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized will be saved. Peter told him in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, on the day of Pentecost, when he said, what should we do? He said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It said that day they responded, and over 3,000 of them were baptized. And the Bible says God added to the church those, Acts 2.47, God added to the church those who were being saved. So baptism is how you are saved. So if you're over here in this camp, and you are a Bible-believing, Jesus-following person who says, you know, baptism doesn't have anything to do with salvation. But then you're over here, and you're a Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christian. You say, no, listen, that is how you are saved. Well, there's a problem there. You're going to have some contradiction. You're going to have a little bit of struggle and rough uh, fellowship taking place right there, right? Because those don't really come back... um, go together very well. But I want to suggest to you, I want to suggest to you, now you may disagree with me, and it's okay if you do, because what, what I'm going to share with you this morning, some of you might find a little, you might find it a little controversial. Somebody listening online might find this a little, a little politically incorrect. And that's okay, because I'm not a politically correct preacher, okay? Um, I, I would suggest that there's actually a third view. Not that I have to say, well, baptism has nothing to do with salvation, because I'm not ready to say that, because I don't think the Bible teaches that. But I'm also not ready to come over here and say, well, that's how you are saved. That's it. Because if that was the case, now I'm going I'm to confess, I kind of wish that were true, right? Because if that was true, then any of you here who haven't been saved yet, I just get Dave, I'll get James, I'll grab Scott, and, and I, I'm a pretty big boy myself. We'll just grab hold of you. We'll just bring you up here. Just, you know, put you, and, hey, he's saved, right? He got baptized. Or I would like to even go a step further. If I go ahead and believe that, I'm going to go ahead and just say, well, sprinkling probably works too. I mean, I know it says immersion in the Bible, but sprinkling is the same thing. Then I'll just go down to Walmart, get one of those big super soakers that I can shoot like, you know, 20 yards. I'll fill that puppy up with some water. I'll bless it. I'll go downtown Stockton and I'll have drive-by baptisms. <laughs> right? So, so, so I would like to be over here, but, but, but I don't think the Bible teaches that baptism is how you are saved. Because I know some people... I shouldn't say this. I have suspected that there are some people who were less than sincere when they were dunked in the water based upon how they lived their life after being dunked in the water saying, I'm giving my all to Jesus now. So only God knows, but I would be suspect. So I think there's a third view, and the third view is this. Baptism is actually a part of the process of salvation. Did I spell it right, Shirley? The other S got cut off by the line. I wanted it to be even. I saw Shirley's Shirley's face instantly. And three-fourths of you wouldn't have noticed. But it is. You can can fill that S in on your outline. If if I had a good secretary, they would have caught that on the... No, I'm just teasing. (laughs) It's a process... Of our salvation. I do not, I, I, I do believe we are saved by grace, and I believe our baptism is a response of faith and obedience to God's saving work of grace. I do not believe baptism is the source of salvation, but I do believe that it is a pivotal step in our response to God's grace through Christ alone. So, so I suggest that you don't have to believe it has nothing to do with salvation, nor do I think you have to say, well, that is how you are saved. But rather, we could say this is the process. Now, next week, you want to come back next week, because I don't have the time this morning. I want to go into this, but I'm going to go into it a lot more and a lot deeper next week. But I suggest that it's a part of the wonderful and amazing process of God's work, his miraculous work of salvation. So what I want to do this morning, and if you have your outline, I gave you three blanks. I want to take a look, if you have your Bible, maybe open to that passage that Scott already read to us from 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want to spend a little bit of time looking at what Peter has to say about the importance of baptism and how this may help some 
who might be asking the question, do I really need to be baptized? And I think Peter really emphasizes the necessity of baptism. It holds this profound symbolism. It is, even though it's a fairly simple passage, I think, to read and understand, it is theologically rich and deep. It talks about Jesus' death. It's going to talk about his resurrection. It's going to talk about the concept of baptism and so much more. So what I did real quickly this morning was just to break it down into three points, all with the letter R to help you remember. So on your outline, first blank under number one, fill this in. We need to understand Christ's work of redemption. When Peter starts with this text, he's going to share with us the importance of understanding what Jesus did for us, what the work of redemption actually cost in the suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus. I was so thankful that the Holy Spirit worked through Clark this morning to share a table talk, a devotional thought before we took the Lord's Supper, and Clark emphasizing the importance of understanding the sacrifice that Jesus made. And I think that something that is essential in making the decision to be baptized, something that is essential in understanding for many of you why you made the decision to be baptized is to understand the suffering and the sacrifice that Jesus made in order to bring redemption for us. So Peter starts off this way, 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sin. It says the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? To bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. This verse highlights Jesus' unique sacrifice because it says a righteous for the unrighteous, but it was more than just a really good guy who died for some people that were not really good people. We're talking about the perfect, sinless Son of God, God in flesh, God in three person, Jesus the Son, who had never sinned, yet died for sin, and he suffered on the cross. He was buried, he was resurrected, and all that makes reconciliation with God possible, this beautiful work of redemption. And it was his death, and his suffering, and his resurrection, and the conquering of death that bridged this gap that had formed because of sin between us and God. So Isaiah, prophetically speaking, over a, almost a thousand years before Jesus would come, about Jesus would say it this way in Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed because of his suffering because of his shed blood on the cross we can experience healing and then paul the next scripture in ephesians 1 verse 7 paul says in him talking about jesus we have redemption how through his blood which provides what the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And church, if we truly begin to have even just the smallest grasp of an understanding of the perfect sacrifice and suffering that Jesus made on our behalf, that he took on sin when he was sinless, then that should overemphasize uh, and, and make us just in a new way, with, with renewed appreciation, have an understanding of what baptism signifies. Because when you are immersed, you're relating to the fact that Jesus died and was buried. When you come out of there of newness of life, you're relating to the fact that Jesus was resurrected, dead in the flesh, but then brought back to life both in flesh and in spirit. And that same resurrection that was made possible because of his suffering, that same forgiveness of sin that is made possible because of his shed blood is something that we come into contact with through our obedient response in faith to the grace of God and being baptized into Christ. You have to, Peter says, you have to understand the suffering of Jesus. And then that should 
naturally lead to the response of number two. Because number two, fill in this next blank, is our obedient response. See, we are baptized into Christ because Jesus said to be baptized into him. We are baptized into Christ because we know outside of Jesus, there's no other name under heaven or earth by which man must be saved. We know that we are baptized into Christ because that is where we come into contact with the cleansing blood that Jesus suffered and shed for our sins. So Peter again in this text says, 1 Peter 3, now verse 21, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Baptism now saves you. Isn't it grace? Yes, but I need to be baptized. Well, and again, this should just be a, a natural response. We should just, man, this is just, I, I can't help but to want to, Jesus was baptized. He told me to be baptized. The Bible says when we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ. So because of his suffering and my understanding of that, it's something I want to do. And I have never understood I, I understand that there are camps of understanding, you know, that your understanding of baptism might be a little bit different than my understanding of baptism, and then you get weirdos who come up with some way in the middle that, that is a mixture that frustrates both sides of the camps, right? I mean, I, I understand that we have different views, but I've never, under, never really understood how any sincere, devoted Jesus follower who understands what Jesus did for us on the cross would even question baptism. I just, I, that doesn't make sense to me. I, don't, I mean, well, are you sure it's what you have to do to be saved? Just do it, and then you don't have to be sure, right? I, I've never understood that. So uh, on, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached that very first sermon, and he's talking about this Jesus whom they crucified, that he was the promised Messiah, that he was this suffering Savior, that they would have all known about Isaiah's prophecy of the Savior who would suffer and who would shed blood for our sins, would die and be risen again. That was Jesus. And their response is, well, what do we do? And then that Acts 2, 38 passage on the screen on your outline, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then it just, you know what the text says they did? They were baptized. I mean, it was that simple. It, it wasn't, well, yeah, but I mean, at what point am I saved? I mean, at what point does it actually happen? I mean, I mean, when do I actually receive the Holy Spirit? I mean, do I receive the Holy Spirit when I decide I need to be baptized? Or, or, or was it that I received the Holy Spirit, which is what prompted me to want to be baptized in the first place? Or, or was, it, was it when I got into the water? Or was it when I was dunked? Well, was it maybe when I, was, when I was dunked under the water. Well, no, is what, was it when I came out of the water? Or, or maybe, it was, was, maybe it was after you got dried off and you came down here and we have to sing we love you with the love of the Lord, right? Is that when it happened? You don't read that. That's not in the text. They just, he said, be baptized. They said, hey, let's get baptized. Now, I put a bunch of scriptures on your outline from the book of Acts. I want to show you this chart that I put together. Now, this chart is online. You can snap a picture of it if you want from your phone, but it's also on the sermon study take-home sheet. You can pick a physical copy up right out there, or you can download it offline. These are examples in this column where it says text of people who heard and responded to the message about Jesus. And all of them have certain things in common. We're going to talk about this a little bit more next week. But the one thing that every example of a conversion to Christ in the book of Acts, which remember, the whole book of Acts, that's all it is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the account of Jesus, and then he died, and then he rose, and then he sent us out on mission, go, preach the word, baptize, those who believe and are saved, uh, uh, those who believe and are baptized will be saved, right? But Acts is them doing it, Right? And every example you'll find, if you look at this, what is it, one, two, three, four, fifth column, it, where I wrote immersed, every one of them were immersed. immersed. You, you, don't, you don't see anywhere where it's questioned. 
And again, I, we, we can discuss, or we can debate, and, and you, you probably know your Bible maybe a, a, a little bit better than, than I know the Bible. And, and, and I've talked with people who are old enough that they forgot more Bible than I really know. And, 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 and we can have arguments and discussions, but, but you don't read that in scriptures. In the scriptures, when people were told about the suffering of Jesus that brought redemption, their natural response was obedience to the command to be baptized. This beautiful work of God through faith in Jesus by grace alone. A few, a few years ago, I did a series that was our theme for the year. It was called Compelled. We looked at Paul's uh, argument, Paul's reason for preaching the gospel was because he was compelled to do so. And I said, you, my challenge to you as a church family was you should be compelled to share that gospel with others. That there are people who need to hear the gospel and the good news that you know. And I challenged you by putting a whiteboard up. Do you remember this? We put a whiteboard up out in the hallway and I asked every one of you just to, to write a name of somebody that you feel compelled to share the gospel with. One name, probably more than one, but one name for sure that was on that list is sitting here in, in, in our church right now. And uh, I, I, I had that picture and I couldn't find it. I have a picture uh, after he was baptized, took a picture of him out there by the board pointing at where somebody had written his name on the board. So what I asked this morning was our brother Mike. Uh, Mike is someone who was on the fence for a little bit. He had been coming here. He had been hearing the message and he had not yet been baptized and, and he made a decision at some point that he did feel he needed to be baptized. So I asked him this morning to come up and just share for a few minutes his own story, his own testimonial, and what it was that got him to make the decision that he needed to be baptized when he was so many years ago. So, Mike, if you'd come on up. Nothing like getting put on the spot. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank Chad for allowing me this opportunity, and I will definitely be looking forward to many of yours as time goes on. Before I begin, I'm going to call out just a handful of names to see if any of you recognize, so just give me a quick hands up. Charles Caps, Jack Van Impey, David Jeremiah, who's the other one? Michael Youssef, and of course, the late, great J. Vernon McGee. Kind of bear with me, I'm going to be a little choked up on this. This all started way back uh, when my grandmother was still alive, because that's where I got introduced to Jay Vernon McGee. She'd be doing dishes in the kitchen as uh, we'd be getting ready to uh, take her out shopping and everything, because eventually, when she got older, she lost her license and couldn't drive anymore. So me and my dad took turns. I'd be there every Tuesday the best I could to run out errand shopping, doctor's appointments, etc. It was there over time when I began listening to Vernon McGee a lot more and started understanding this. Now keep in mind, this is a very dark period of time in my life. I listened to satanic music, watched horror movies, and had a very filthy mouth. But as time went on, as I was listening to this, I decided it was, I needed a change in my life. So as a little bit of time went on, and after having been moved to Lodi, and listening to these sermons along the way, I decided it was changed in my life, so I decided I kind of wanted to return to church, but was not sure of myself. So little time went on, then I was eventually one early Sunday morning driving down Lodi Avenue approaching Fairmont, and I told myself, this is it. You either get that left turn lane, or you go straight. I got in the left turn lane, and been back ever since. After having been back for about a say two, almost two and a half years, 
had a little conviction in my life that I wanted to be baptized after witnessing so many of them. So another couple weeks went by, and then I had a strong conviction in my heart. It was my time. So on March 3rd, 2019, if he remembers correctly, Kevin was the one that did the honors. And I was very, very happy to be that way because it was a new life, a new beginning. And I want to tell you folks, keep your faith extremely strong because that dirty devil out there will do anything to make you slip. That's why it is so important to keep that armor of God on tight. And also remember, he that overcometh, I bring my reward with me. There's no doubt about that in my mind. I am going to shift topics just for a moment here. How many of you have you read the book of Revelation, say, more than two or three times? This is a quick show of hands. Good handful of you. Good. There's one verse in there that weighs on my mind quite a bit, and that's Revelation 1, chapter, or pardon me, chapter 1, verse 7. Keep this in mind, something for you to ponder over time. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Think about that. Israel is on the other side of the world. We're over here. You still have Africa, Europe, and the rest of the countries of the world. And I have a strong conviction in my heart that this, the cell phone, is going to be a key player in that because every eye will see him. It doesn't matter if you're in an airplane, out kayaking, riding a bike, walking the street, or in the submarine. It will be seen. And what's really startling that uh, gives me shivers once in a while when I reread that verse, even the ones that pierce his side are going to see it. Boy, if that doesn't scare you, nothing will. Just remember to keep that armor of God on all the time, folks, and stay strong in your faith. Now, just before Chad comes up here, I'd like to share one last final thought with you. Despite the earthquakes, the famines, the wars, the hatred, everything that goes on in this world, as Jack Van Ippy said two years ago, what a time to be alive, folks! <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Much appreciated. Really, really appreciate that. Let me give you one more on your outline. We understand Christ's work of redemption. It ought to be an, an obedient response because of understanding Christ's work of redemption. And then number three, we, it's the understanding and what Peter says in this text, that baptism is a cleansing and a renewal. It's a cleansing and a renewal. I, I'm glad that Peter, when he wrote that, and he says, this water, you know, and, and if you read the whole text, it, it, describing the, 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 the time of Noah that, and how God saved Noah, and it was Noah's response. Noah got into the ark, Right? And getting into the ark saved him. Did the ark save him? Did the water save him? Well, God saved him, right? And it was his response to getting in. And, and baptism is, is how we get into Christ. So Peter says in the second part of chapter 3, verse 21, after he says this water that symbolizes baptism now saves you, he wants you to understand though, but, but it's not the removal of dirt from the body, Right? It's, it's not that you are physically dirty and, and, and we'll get you clean in here. I mean, it, if you are physically dirty, we can get you a little bit cleaner dunking you in there. But that's not what baptism's about. It, Peter's saying that it's not the water that saves you. But rather, look what this is. It is a pledge of a clear conscience towards God. Getting into Christ through baptism is a pledge. The water doesn't save you. You can get wet and not be saved. Your baptism is your pledge of yourself to God. It, it, baptism is it, not just an external cleansing, although there is a cleansing that happens spiritually. It, it's definitely not a ritual, although it's something that Jesus told us to do, uh, to remember his death. And, and to, significant, to, to signify it through our baptism, to take the Lord's Supper like we did a few minutes ago, remembering his broken body and his shed blood. But it's a, it's a symbol of an inner transformation. It's a public profession of your commitment to God. It's not the water that saves you. It's the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus that saves us. But what happens at baptism, that is where you say we are all in. 
I, I don't know how appropriate it is for a preacher to use a poker illustration from the pulpit, but that's a lot of peas, and I'm going to do it anyway. If you're familiar, even if you've never played poker in your life, regardless of what your beliefs are about gambling, I... <laughs> True story, <laughs> I was preaching in a church, guest speaking one time, and I said something about, I bet you, and I made some point, and one of the elders came up to me and said, hey, uh, young man, you ought to be careful about saying, I bet, because there are some people in the church might hear that, and they might think you're a gambling person, and I said, what are the odds of that, you know, but anyway, <laughs> um, so whether, whether you are a, a person that gambles or not or know a card, most of you understand what it means if a person playing cards is going to go all in, right? Have you seen it on TV? You see the person has the stack of chips, and what do they do? They just push it. This is all or nothing. I mean, there's no coming back. This is, this is it, nothing. Else. If I lose, I'm done. But if I win, I'm gaining a lot. That's what you are saying in baptism. You are saying that, hey, I have decided, like Mike said, he came back, he had been here for several years, but I am deciding it's time, I am all in. And for those of you who have done that, you need to be reminded that you are supposed to be all in for Jesus, right? And those who haven't, if you're on the fence, the way I would answer the question, do I need to be baptized? Are you ready to be all in for Jesus? Then yes, because it's just how Noah got into the ark. It's how we get into Jesus. It's where cleansing takes place. It's where renewal takes place. It's our obedient response because we understand the work of Jesus' suffering that brought redemption and reconciliation. And when we are baptized, we are baptized to have our sins washed away. And we are pledging. We are pledging ourselves, our clear conscience to God. A couple more passages real quick and I'm going to wrap up. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. And that is what some of you were, Paul talking about your previous life outside of Christ. But now that you have been baptized into Christ, he says, you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. I love that. Washed, sanctified, and justified. That's a good sermon right there, right? Titus chapter 3, verse 5, He, Jesus, saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He, Jesus, saved us through the washing. The washing didn't save us, but it's through the washing that Jesus saved us and gives us rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Overall, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22 emphasizes the centrality, the, the, the crucial understanding of Jesus' sacrifice, his triumph over death, his triumph over the devil, his triumph over spiritual powers, the transformative nature and the power of baptism that aligns us with and in that victory through Christ alone. And it's a reminder of the depths of God's plan and his incredible love for us. Let's dive deeper together in the importance of God's miraculous work through baptism into Christ. Let me pray for you. Lord, I ask a blessing right now upon all who are here. I pray if there is anyone who is on the fence, who hasn't yet been baptized, uh, bring them back next week so they can hear the message next week. But Lord, even today, if, if, if you are working in their hearts and on their minds to be baptized, that they might make that decision today. Lord, for those of us who have made that decision, who have put you on in baptism, who have confessed that you are Lord and Savior, who have strived to repent of our sins and to live the life that you have called us to live. Help us to remember that decision we made because it was Jesus' sacrifice and his suffering that made reconciliation possible. It was our response to your grace through faith in Jesus that caused us to take that step and to be baptized and help us to remember that that washing and that cleansing and that renewal 
pledged us a good conscience as we have said that we are all in with Christ. And I pray, Lord, that what we say, how we pray, what we sing in this room on Sunday would also happen out there on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that we would live a life that's indicative to the fact that we serve you, the true and the living God, and our salvation is secure in Christ all and only because of the work you did for us through Christ and our response to your love in our life. Help us to live that. Help us to testify and to share that to others. We ask this in Jesus' name and all who agree say, amen. We never want to close a time together without giving you an opportunity to respond even while you're here this morning. So I don't know if there's anyone here this morning that has not yet been baptized and you feel like you're ready to take that step, we'll do it right now, this morning, right here. Um, if you're watching online, you want to learn a little bit more, just type baptism in the comment and we'll get back with you and, and be willing to pray for you and share some stuff with you. Also, we usually extend... Even though